overnight, my dad's livelihood completely changed. Our livelihood completely changed. The aftermath of that was we ran out of money. We almost were homeless. I had to work as a janitor. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't know. It, I guess there are some benefits to it in that we learned this absurd work ethic. I came out of that whole thing hating wealthy people and this uh, mindset that the world is against us and we have to work like a dog to defeat the system. And, and, and also, we hated millionaires. <laughs> well, as someone who has lost, not as much as your father, but as someone who went from 30, 40,000 ish to zero ish in a couple of days, uh, that hurts. <laughs> and I cannot imagine putting that on steroids, having people depending on me. In my case, what I felt was physical sickness. I, I wanted to go throw up. What advice would you give someone in your father's case? How do you, where do you go from receiving such a low blow, like an uppercut when you're just down and you're like, whoa. I have a saying that I use all the time and it's survive until you thrive. Never lose sight of your goals and your dreams, even though th the world just punched you in the gut. Stay focused uh, on your dreams and your goals. And of course, when you're in the moment uh, where your emotional center of the brain, the amygdala, has taken control, there is nothing you can do for a 24-hour period. You are uh, at the whim of your emotional center of the brain. You need sleep, an eight-hour night's sleep, to reset the emotional baseline back to normal. So there's nothing you can do in the moment. You have to sleep on it. But the very next morning... What I would recommend is that you sit down and you script out about 500 words of what your ideal future life is going to be like in 10 years, let's say. When you're forced to focus, whenever you focus, there's a region of the brain that actually shuts down the emotional center of the brain. It creates like a Chinese firewall so that your emotions can't interfere. What I'm asking them to do is to shift your focus from woe is me. You have to have a destination. You just, you just got punched in the gut. Your life is completely upside down. Now what are you going to do? Well, you, you, you can't just say, well, I'm going to take action. Well, what are you going to take action on? You better have a clear vision of how you're going to, where you want to go. Your brain will come up with the right actions and goals that you need to pursue in order to realize that vision. It's basically just neurohacking. You, you got punched in the gut. Life pulled the rug out from underneath you. What do you do? You neurohack because it's all happening up here in the brain. Uh, yeah, you might not be able to pay bills. You might. Those are all ancillary, stressful, ancillary things. The strategy to overcome poverty or a downturn in your life, a financial downturn, is to come up with a plan of action. And that's why I like the, um, I call it the future letter. It's a script you write about your future life as if it's in real time, as if you're 10 years out into the future and you write down, hey, this is what my life is like, blah, blah, blah. And this is how I got there. 500 words. That gives you a GPS on what, where you, your destination is. And then your brain will go to work, the subconscious will go to work and, cre and start through intuition, start nudging you to take this action, take that action. Yeah, and I think that not just with the, as far as finances go, I think that with every downturn in life, whether it's relationships, a breakup, I don't know, whatever, I think that the faster you can shift your mindset from what happens to the future tense, the better you're going to be. And maybe in, in this particular case, it's also important for people to realize that their value, you know, because a lot of times when you lose everything, you notice that you measured your self-worth with your wealth, which is one of the biggest mistakes. But the value is here. Actually, actually, the value is you plus whatever lesson you're going to learn. I mean, a while ago, I decided that until I'm financially stable, I'm not entering a relationship. As a matter of fact, if I'm broke, I'm not even entering the dating scene. I, I still believe that. But you know, when I lost money, it was like my whole self-worth just dropped. And I think that that was one of the mistakes that I was making all along. So, you know, looking back, it was one of the greatest lessons ever. I mean, failure is, I think I would be way more successful now if I just failed more in the past. But you brought up an important point, Erska, and I want, I, I want, I want uh, your listeners to, uh, to focus on this. Um, confidence is fleeting. 
when somebody says he or she is a highly confident person, that's at that moment. That person fails or that person makes a mistake, they have lost their confidence. Now they regroup and they regain their confidence by taking action and then succeeding again or by gaining some competency that you, that you lack that caused you to fail or make the mistake, right? But I want to point this out to everybody that confidence is not a fixed thing. It is fleeting. It, I'm telling you there are this, some of the millionaires, the self-made millionaires in my study, the, the comments they made about a lack of confidence for 10 years while they were pursuing their dreams and their goals. Can you imagine having zero confidence in yourself for 10 years while you're pursuing your dreams and your goals? I mean, that, it's astounding to me that they succeeded. So confidence has very little to do with success. Confidence increases or decreases with competence and success. It's not a critical criteria for you to um, become successful, uh, except I'll, I'll say this, when you're selling anything, you have to, even if you have to pretend that you're confident, you have to pretend that you're confident in what you're selling. And then that's going to be good enough. Sometimes the what you put out there, like the behavior, the external of it, it's good enough. Not always, but sometimes. I think the same goes with patience. You know, when you, for this podcast, for example, I've been doing this now for two and a half years. And I it just started growing. I just got monetized. And people would say that's patience. Well, I'm impatient as fuck inside. Inside, though. But my outside behavior shows as if I am patient because I've been doing it consistently so, you know, for such a long period of time. So sometimes behavior is good enough. When you were nine, your family went from being multimillionaires to being broken just one night, which is almost impressive. Uh, so how did that happen? If you my could father's like uh, had so his his partner, who was the sales genius, died of a heart attack at 39 and they were making millions of dollars. And now my my dad said, well, I'm going to sell the business. So he sold the business for like, back then it was like four and a half million dollars. And uh, he was supposed to get three installments. He got one installment. The contract uh, forced the business back to my dad. So my dad took the business back. And uh, magically, uh, about, I don't know, within a week of my dad taking the business back, there was arson on the warehouse, his main warehouse. He had three of them, but the main one on the East Coast was uh, burned to a crisp. So he lost uh, about two, uh, two million dollars of inventory. The people that he had sold the business to that he had taken back from, they had changed everything. They changed the insurance company. They changed the way that they bought inventory. My dad always did cash payments. They did 90 days. He could have just bankrupted the company and just said, I've got my three million dollars. You guys are on your own. I'm bankrupting the company. But instead, he paid them all off. 